Hey Brandon. Hello. Hey. How are you? Good. Man. Good. So, Good. This is, so this is the first for me, the first time I um, I interview someone. So I hope I don't completely mess I'm it up. I'm sure you're gonna do well. I'll cover for you if you ask any dumb questions. I'll, Please. I'll, yeah. Every question will be the best question. I promise. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> there are no it's very very assuring. There are no dumb questions, right? Exactly. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd start with a with a few kind of quick, easy ones. Okay. That are a bit abstract. Okay. So abstract. Uh, do you think we're uh, do you think we're alone in the universe? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're not even alone on Earth. Um, do you, do we think that there's other intelligent uh, life, life in the universe? Other, other planets other than Earth. <sighs> well, here's the argument that I have against it, all right? Um, if there is a intelligence out there and there is nearly like an infinite amount of time uh, that the universe has existed or just a, a massive amount of time then that intelligence has had a near infinite amount of time to discover us um so i think it's you know i think it's very hard to imagine that some sort of intelligent life is going to make contact with us in this short window of human existence if you know if our planet hasn't been discovered in the, you know, previous zillion, uh, you know, years before that. So you think it's, it's just a matter of we're not uh, well, it's, it's like a, worthy yet or it's just a... I, I just like, you know, why if, if, if there's some super intelligence out there and, you know, there's been billions and billions and billions of years to kind of explore like the universe and kind of you know discover things like do they already know that we're here and they're just not choosing or they just haven't stumbled across us yet and if they haven't stumbled across us yet seems very unlikely in you know the next thousand or two thousand years that that's going to be the little sliver of time that they happen to kind of come across earth yeah. but i don't know i don't understand much about it are you leaning more towards that there's probably some, something out there, but the chances of us basically intersecting is, is so I minute. I mean, I just, I, I think that, you know, you hear, you hear the people say, you know, I went to a lecture by kind of like a NASA, you know, engineer, uh, or a NASA, you know, physicist, not an engineer, just somebody who thinks about this stuff, you know, and they talk about like, the, oh, we found a planet for the, with the conditions for life. And it's like, well, what is that? Just like, oh, it's water. Okay, so you know, a you know, a planet with water, it's just life is is going to just spontaneously appear. I mean, we can't even explain that. Yeah. You know, I've read lots of books on evolution, and, and you know, the very first action, you know, the first action where life, you know, life appeared from non-life it's still something that hasn't been explained in any way that kind of satisfies me logically you know um and so you know it does seem to me uh like a one in infinity type of miracle and if there are infinity planets out there you know the the chance of a one in infinity you know type of miracle um you know just kind of spontaneously combusting uh, you know, I think the the scales are pretty balanced there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so there's we'll also see. there's also the uh, you know life has existed here on this planet in the harshest of environments, like you know in the depth of the oceans in in right, in all, lava. but all springing all springing from that first life, that first single celled organism that we don't know how it suddenly animated itself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's like uh, it's I think that I am. Uh, you know, I think there's, first of all, I don't know. I, I don't think that there is or there is, and I have no way of knowing. Uh, but I think I'm a little less certain about it than uh, a lot of people who think about it a lot. Yeah. So then, yeah, so I guess uh, there is no alien brand sort of roaming around doing sort of ET stories around the, around the universe. 50-50 shot. 50-50 <laughs> shot. Um, if you could relive one year of your life, again mm. what you would you mean like do it differently or just relive it because i enjoyed it so much yeah just relive it because you enjoyed it so much <sighs> probably like 27 28 when you know humans of new york went from something that was kind of this wild idea that i had that 
was me just doing it every day, excuse me, every day with no, you know, nobody paying attention, no way of making a living, no way of knowing that it was going to be sustainable, living in New York, hardly knowing anybody, to suddenly, you know, being this internationally recognized, you know, blog over the course of like a year. So do you enjoy mainly like the, the uncertainty of living through that period and not knowing what's coming around the blog or like well, the, it was the validation? The, I mean, it was the uncertainty met with the, the massive success. You know, it wasn't like I was starting from like here, like, oh, I'm going to, you know, try this idea. Like, oh, it worked. This is amazing. You know, it wasn't like I was starting from here and I went up here. I was starting from here to this isn't working. This isn't working. I'm working so hard. Is this ever going to work? 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 Is this ever going to work to up here? And in that journey, when you like put the sacrifice and the commitment and the dedication and the doubt and the insecurity and all of those negative things and, and you invest all of that and you put all of yourself into that and then you kind of get to this, this place and then to have that pay off, you know, that's the powerful ride up. It's not necessarily, you know, you know, just buying a lottery ticket and winning. Yeah. It's, you know, taking this kind of giant risk and then having it pay off. And it's kind of the validation of those experiences and having those experiences make that, you know, the ride up that much more powerful. Yeah. I mean, when I found out the book was the number one New York Times bestseller, um, the very first book I had, and I, it was completely unexpected. Like, I thought there was no possible chance that it would happen. It was coming out during the holiday season when all the biggest books come out um and you know when my agent called gave me that book i literally sat in a parking lot and cried for two hours because it was like it was like the the immediate kind of release of you know all of this stuff down here you know which was all of the all of the time spent you know all of the risk that i took all of the uncertainty all of the doubt immediately that was all washed away. Are you a guy who sort of expresses these kind of emotions outwardly or like do you uh, usually use... I'm them? a pretty emotional dude, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you'd have to be doing that kind of... Right? I think so. Um, but you do know, you feel I that you need to create like a... I mean, you, you hear so, so many stories, some of them beautiful, some of them tragic, beautifully tragic in a way or whatever. Do you feel that you need to kind of guard yourself a little bit? Just like somebody, like a paramedic that goes out every day or like a, or a surgeon or something, you know? I mean... A little bit, uh, you know, but so many, I think so much of the part of encouraging somebody to share and being kind of receptacle for these stories is being unguarded. Um, you know, being able to mimic the emotion of the person, to be able to feel what the person is feeling. You know, if, if, you're, if you're having this conversation and one person's getting very emotional and the other person's very stoic, it becomes uncomfortable pretty fast. The person becomes very self-conscious about the emotion they're feeling. They kind of reel it back in. They kind of guard themselves. So, you know, I think a big part of, of being somebody that somebody feels comfortable sharing with is is being able to go to that place with them yeah. so you know it does require a, a lot of feeling um you know i think i you have no choice but after it's over to not think about it all day long about how you can't help the person uh how the person's life is tragic and the arc of it is probably heading towards more tragedy um you can't you you can't dwell on that or you wouldn't be able to function um but you know in the in the moment there's not a distance that i try to create yeah that makes sense so if i, I want to go back to a little bit about the the interview process of it but i want to go a little bit back uh in time ask you a bit about your upbringing like where what, like where you born where did you grow up uh, I grew up in Georgia, um, and it's a, a southern state for the international uh, yeah, people who are watching country. this. Just north of Florida, close to Disney World. Not south of Russia. Not south of <laughs> Russia, exactly. Um, and so I, you know, had a very normal suburban American upbringing. Um, what is what was the biggest experience in your long, young life, like as a like as a school kid? Biggest experience? Do you mean biggest experience? Just as far as what's most memorable? Biggest experience in related related to the work that I do now? No, just, um, a, just a, at the time you would have felt that that was the most profound, the biggest thing that happened to you, the thing you're most excited about. And what age are we talking about? School. 
so you know like uh, well maybe up to middle school kind of thing hmm biggest that one's hard to define um just define it the way you want but just something that you know that would at that time would have been the thing that you know would psych you the most in terms of something that you went through or you or you did or or something that also could sort of colored your your upbringing at that time yeah i think you know i think the probably the the difficulty that i'm having in thinking about it is is probably indicative of a pretty good childhood okay um things were pretty structured things were pretty stable you're a bit, um, you're a, you're a big skier, right? I am a big skier. I okay. was thinking about my ski trips, but I was like, those were enjoyable. But yeah. like that, I don't know if they really changed the. Uh, I don't know. If my dad was a ski instructor, and so I, you know, went to. Um, I went skiing a lot, which was a wonderful part of my childhood. What about the? I mean, is there, is there something from there, like the discipline of it, or like you know, you sticking to something? Well, for me, I was not a very disciplined skier. I was a big risk taker. Uh, my brother was so much better of a skier than me, but I would always ski the double black diamonds and he won it um, just because, uh, you know, I think my dad would always ski them and I wanted to do that. Um, so, you know, I was very much of a risk taker on the ski slopes, but I wasn't that great. I mean, I got down the hill, yeah. but like, my brother had that perfect form and, you know, he had the the perfect turns where I'm just kind of, you know, all, all wild, but I, you know, had the, uh, I, I, there's nothing I wouldn't ski. Yeah. And what about if you move a bit forward to, let's say, university time, is there like... Well, that's when sense? things, that's, that's when things kind of, that's when the upheaval kind of started. Um, you know, and I think the, yeah, if, if there was, I, you know, I guess if there was a kind of arc or a trend in my childhood, it was kind of the stability and, and, the, and the structure and, you know, things being very good and normal. Um, and then there being kind of an, an upheaval. Um, Is that in, internal? Upheaval? Well, or? I mean, both. <laughs> I think internal leading to external. Uh, you know, there was a, you know, upheaval around... 15, 16, probably to the age of 22, involving a lot of drug use, um, you know, not doing well in school, eventually flunking out of school, um, not having much direction. Like the drug use, is that more kind of recreational or do you feel like it sort of got out of... Oh, it, I mean, that depends. Definitely felt recreational at the time. Uh, looking back, it was probably pretty excessive. Um, you know, luckily, it never, you know, got so bad that I needed to go to rehab or anything. I was able to bring myself out of it. Um, but I was, I was very much a, kind of like you, uh, very much an explorer, but just of a, a different variety. <laughs> um, I wasn't climbing mountains. I was diving into my brain. Um, were you like a, were you like a aloof, like an outgoing kind of person? I was very um, outgoing. I was like always class president. Um, for like all four years, uh, student council, stuff like that, of my high school. So, you know, I was very much um, very social. Uh, you think that part of your life is like more subdued now? I mean, I get the, I mean, we've known each other for a few years. I get the feeling that you're more of a sort of a quiet sort of... I did. Well, I always had that part in me. Um, I think that I embraced that more um, when I... Once I started uh, <laughs> kind of withdrawing, I think the drugs were just kind of a uh, lot, a lot of marijuana. Still smoke a little marijuana. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, lots of psychedelics at the time. Um, you know, I think that was a lot of me just kind of trying to figure things out. You know, what are the different layers of experience this world has to offer? What are the different perspective? What are the different layers of thinking? Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, it was the introversion. I think that's probably a, a, you know, a reflection of kind of the turn towards introversion because I've always been a thinker. There was a sense of like trying to figure out your place in the world, trying to figure out what, what, yeah, like, what is truth, you know, in the most cheesy kind of the cor corny way of saying it, you know, it's just like, what is the foundation of all of this? What are first principles, you know? Yeah. Like going back to the talk about, you know, the aliens or whatever, you know, what was the, f the first action? What was the, th what was the, what was the th first thing that turned, you know, like 
you know, non-life and into life, you yeah. know. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, the the amoeba, yeah, but before that, you know, and then before that, like, what was the first thing that animated? Um, and you know, that's just one kind of like reflection of it. But if if there is some sort of first animation, does that mean there's it, there's truth? If there is truth, does that mean there's meaning? If there is meaning, is there something that we're supposed to be doing that's not necessarily going to school and doing your homework yeah. and getting a job? And if there is, I should probably figure it out now and not when I'm 50 years old so I have time to do something about it and I don't go down that path. So instead of going down the path, I'm going to take many steps back. I'm going to do a lot of drugs and I'm going to think about it. Okay. And, that's and it was like it a solid. Do you feel like it was a sort of a solitary path at, path at the time, or it was just a you know everyone was kind pretty of pretty solitary. My friends all did drugs too, um, but I very much liked to be alone. Even when I was with people and we were doing drugs, I would walk away um, to think and about what, what things. What were you studying at the time at university? Uh, I was business. Like that was part of the problem too. It's cause, and that was just like practicality play. Yeah. Because I didn't know, and it's just like you know I had this like this part of me that was like thinking and kind of going very deep over here, and then there's a the part of me that was just kind of slowly trudging forward, you know, kind of along the path that I thought that I was going to be taking that I that I that would provide some security, um, you know, while I explored these other things, uh, but eventually this just kind of overpowered this and you know I went too far this way too you know it's not like it, it's not like I think that this is like the the right path that you know everyone should do which is like tune out of the world and plug into your head and and try to figure things out you know there's a a, a balance and a dialectic to everything and and you know there is a place for this but there is also a place um you know the place for engaging with the world and you know, I went very far in this direction, um, and you know, I think hopefully, I, you know, I've come to kind of a place where there still is a bit of this. But you know, so much of my later success and so much of my forward movement, and you know, so much of you know what I was able to accomplish was coming back from that place and engaging with the world again. Yeah. So, so what was your what was your first job like out of university? Bond trader, like straight out of straight out of university. Yeah. Um, well, I flunked out of school. I was studying business, and I went back. And then, when I flunked out of school, is when I really kind of started re-engaging with the world um, and moving forward again, because I knew that I was going to have to if I was going to have any sort of quality of life. Um, so I started reading a lot uh, of nonfiction. Um, started educating myself because instead of going to class and, and educating myself. I was doing a lot of drugs and thinking about a lot of things. Uh, so I started reading a lot um, of nonfiction books and the ones that were most interesting to me were history. And so I decided to go back to school and study history since I was reading a ton of that anyways. Um, and you know I thought that would be pretty easy for me, which it was. Uh, and so I went back to school and made very good grades and graduated, but then I had a history degree and I still wasn't sure what exactly what I was going to do. So you finished the history degree? Yes. And then you went, so I mean, do you have a sort of a, an innate love for low risk asset classes and that's what you decided to be a bond trader? Low, low, oh, low risk asset questions? No. Um, what happened was in the, my senior year of college, um, uh, it was when Barack Obama, it was 2008, um, and it was when Barack Obama was running for the first time and he was in the primaries, and I was reading a lot about that, and based on the reading I was doing, I was sure that he was going to win um, the primary, and so I took out $5,000 in student loans and I bet it. <laughs> On Barack Obama to win the primary, um, and I did. I didn't make a ton of money. It was just like you know, uh, because he was already favored, so it was just like a, you know, a, a return on the money. But anyways, I was telling that story to my friend, who was a bond trader in Chicago. 
Um, and he, from that story, determined that I would be a good bond trader and said I could get you an interview with my boss. And um, at that time, I didn't know what else I would be doing, and it seemed very lucrative. Um, and so... So you did that for how many years? Two. Okay. Yeah. That was a very swift... Uh, I actually worked in bonds. Oh, did you? In, in London and Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did, and then, uh, did you sell them or did you trade them? I originated uh, them. Oh, okay. You drafted them. Yeah. Okay. And um, in an investment bank. And then uh, I got... Uh, I then left the bank to go traveling the world for 370 days. Then okay. they took me back miraculously. Mm. Um, and then I was like sort of... Combi- I get, and then I sort of got laid off. Okay. So um, how did... So, you know, two years and then... What, ma- what made you decide to leave it all oh, i got fired mm-hmm. um well you think, was, that you think it was, was it justified well it was fire? in 2008 okay. um and not to get too far into the weeds but you know the type of trading we did was trading that worked in very low volatility and it had the, there had been very low volatility for about 10 years and um suddenly 2008 happened and there was record high volatility so um the type of trading that we were doing wasn't working very well uh anymore uh and i couldn't figure out a new way in a short enough amount of time to avoid losing all the money that i'd made um so it was a swift ride up and a swift ride okay. down so the part of your story that is relatively known is that you, you you know you packed up your bags chicago you went to new york you know you stayed um at a friend's uh sofa for some time like what was going through your mind at that time, and when did you st- stop looking for work? I mean, I mean, was part of going to New York actually to find a job, or mm. was it purely just I want to discover this city that I've been wanting to visit? No, for neither. It was I want to do humans of New York. Um, you know, I'd started, I started photographing before I got fired, um, and then, you know, and, and even when I was bond trading, I'd wanted to do something creative. The entire, um, the entire. Uh, Whole entire thrust was I was going to make some money and then pivot and use that to kind of finance a creative life. That was my plan. Um, and then after two years, I lost my job and I didn't have any money to show for it. And I realized that plan hadn't really paid many dividends. And so I decided that I'm just going to try to do something creative now. I had been photographing for a few months as a hobby. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was starting to take pictures of people on the street, and I thought that I kind of had a knack for that. I was good at kind of stopping people, um, which can be an intimidating thing to do. Um, And so I was getting these kind of intimate pictures of of random people, Uh, and I too started traveling, and I was doing this work in different cities, and I got to New York, and there was such a, you know, density and array of people uh, that I, you know, decided I am going to try to move here. And I had this idea where I was going to photograph 10,000 people and I was going to plot their photos on a map. And that was the beginning of Humans of New York. And that's the only reason I moved to New York. Uh, so all the photography and all the work that you did before that, that w- was not, w- never sort of made it to, to Humans of New York as it No, as it's it just on now. my personal Facebook page. It's still there. Um, you know, it's very raw and very uh, unpolished. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, do you f- how do you feel like your, your work sort of matured over the years? Well, it's not even photography anymore. It's the main thing. Um, the photography is, is very secondary. You know, I don't even really view myself as a, a photographer. You know, I've got a style and I can take some nice photos. I think but I heard you say, I can't remember if it was an interview or an article, that you think that your photography maybe even got a little worse over time. It got less interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be that I was in the early days of Humans of New York. <clears throat> I was I was doing some candid photography that some of it was it was quite good, and it was quite good only because I put so much work into it. I mean, I don't care what your photography skills are. If you are willing to spend eight hours a day walking through the streets of New York City, you're going to find some great candid photography if you put in the work and just get it in the frame. Um, so. You know, there's there's some stuff in that first book that that's great, um, just uh, by virtue of me working so hard to get it. Um, the work became much more about the storytelling, um, and then by nature, uh, you know, the the photography became more of a complement to the interview I was doing, and by nature, 
it therefore became less interesting because you don't want you don't want the photography to to overshadow the person's story. I mean, you don't want to have somebody telling like a very you know powerful story about their life and then have them composed in the far right corner with all these wacky angles and lines. You want it to be a very intimate photo. Yeah. You know, and there's when you when you're that close and you're the kind of that intimate, there's you know very you know, there's a lot less that you can play with. So, you know, by nature and in to serve the story, the photography got a lot less interesting. Okay. And um, moving track a little bit, like, you know, tell me a little bit about your life now. I, I, I know that you're married. Can you, can you tell us a bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, you're married to... Um, yeah, so my... How, you've been married for how long? I mean, last time, last time we actually met, I think you, you, were, you were still dating. Yeah, you know, so we didn't put much stock in the actual ceremony itself. We didn't even have a wedding. We've been together for about eight years, nine years now, or about eight years. Um, Did you and, guys meet? Uh, we met through Humans of New York back when it was very small. Um, my now wife, uh, back when I only had like 300 or 400 followers, she was working at a jewelry store doing their PR and she used to write on all of my photos she was like one of the three comments on each one of my photos <laughs> saying hey we love your work um you know come visit us things like that uh, i'm gonna have to go back and, and look at those comments uh did you eventually go and visit the jewelry store not intentionally i was just walking one day um in the neighborhood uh where her jewelry store was and i looked up and i happened to see the sign and then I walked in, and there was it was tiny stores, only like three people there at the time, um, and she was one of them. And uh, was it the rest is history? Yeah. Can you, can you describe that moment where you kind of? Uh, I was intimidated because she was really hot, um, <laughs> and I think I got out of there like really quickly because uh, I was nervous. Uh, but then I sent her an email later, uh, and then we got together. Yeah. Very cool. And um, what does she do? She no. um, is a, a kind of a celebrity in her own right. Um, she runs a, a senior dog rescue called Susie Senior Dogs, which is a, has a pretty massive following on social media. And basically what she does is she serves as a connector that she will like, call around to the different shelters. And she doesn't call anymore. They come to her um around the country that have dogs that are very old and that nobody wants and have been there for years and so she takes like the oldest and most unadoptable dogs at all the shelters and writes them a nice little profile and gives them a lot yeah. of personality and puts them on her page and every single one of these dogs gets adopted she has adopted thousands of dogs uh, that otherwise would still be in the shelter. And of course you guys get to keep some as well, right? Yes, well, we, we, right. Get, our, we get our pick of the litter, uh, say, <laughs> I remember the last so, to, <laughs> so to speak. And well, <laughs> pick of the litter means a 15-year-old chihuahua and diapers and a, uh, a you know, 10-year-old pit bull with memory masses all <laughs> over. But, you know, we, we get to pick the ones we love the most. I remember yeah. when I came to your apartment, uh, I think we, we walked two dogs, which I think had a combined three, three teeth and I heard, I heard the you thing. yeah I, I heard that that was your description of my dogs I got a kick out of that <laughs> that's really cool um, what about um, I know that you've you've, um, you've you have a baby now yes her name is Savannah is that inspired by a trip to Africa or I uh, know we just thought it sounded sweet uh, we want a sweet daughter and yeah. it sounded like a sweet name that's really cool. And uh, do you miss her when you're out on tour? I mean, how's that change? Well, she for is. Uh, she, yes, um, she is. You know, this trip in particular was tough. Uh, it was one that I had to make because I'm working on an international book now, and I have already pushed the deadline back two different years. So I need to finish it. Um, and I requires you know one of the. I've been to about five or six countries in Africa, but I haven't been to enough. Uh, so I needed to go to another five or six more, um, and I wanted to get that out of the way while she was still as young as possible, um, because uh, she's still kind of at the point where she, she, I don't think she even recognizes me. Um, but it's, it is hard, because um, I'm technically missing half of her life so far, yeah. uh, but luckily my wife is very good at documenting, so I'm getting many uh, updates every single day. So it, so it kind of factors a little bit into your decision making, or you feel that it's something that 
you yeah, and I'm sure want to make room for us. Oh, well, yeah, and I'm sure it's going to, you know, factor more and more and more as uh, she gets older. Yeah. Outside of that, even before, let's say, before you, your daughter um, was born, like, what would you do or what can you do as sort of outside of Humans of New York as, like, hobbies or, you know, is there anything? Really? No, not much. You're pretty much interviewing people during yeah. the day and writing them It's like them just the work. I mean, the, the work is just, like, so varied. I mean, yeah, travel to places and talk to people. You know, there's just so much of a variety of experience in that that you just don't really need a hobby. So, you, you know, my hobby... Really like, uh, you know, I wish I had time to do this or that. I mean, sometimes, but it's not, it's not like, uh, you know, I was just writing something this morning on my Patreon page about how... You know, the, I mean, like, for example, I'm in Egypt right now, and, you know, I can only, because I've got to go to Ghana, and then Nigeria, then Rwanda, then South Africa, I can only be here for a very short amount of time, and I have to spend that time working, because I'm in each country for such a small amount of time, that if I take a day off, then that's 20% less photos, um, and, you know, you want to cover one country as much as you can. And, you know, whenever I go to these countries, uh, you know, people are like, oh, you need to go see this. The most beautiful beach is an hour that way. The most beautiful mountain you've ever seen is two hours that way. And so I never really have time to kind of just absorb, I guess, kind of the natural beauty of places, um, you know, because the, you know, the work is so intensive. But, I mean... At the same time, it's it's not like a trade-off of, of a good thing for a bad thing. It's a trade-off of a, a great thing for a great thing. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like what I'm doing is great. Meeting these people is great. Talking to these people is great. You know, and there's enough of variety in the work and variety in the experience. I mean, my mandate is just talk to people, learn their stories. I mean, there's just an endless amount of variety of the ways and places that you can do that. So, I mean, I just don't feel the need for a hobby because I get so much nourishment yeah. and enjoyment out of the work. Uh, I enjoy going to the gym. Uh, you know, I enjoy hanging out with my wife and my dogs and I enjoy hanging out with my friends. Uh, I like to watch a little Netflix. That's about it. Any shows that you would like? Um, lots of shows that I like. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for the, uh, the obvious ones. Uh, Breaking Bad was a fantastic journey, a novelistic journey. Uh, Game of Thrones, uh, Better Call Saul, uh, yeah, it's like I don't have time to watch a ton, uh, yeah. but you know, the ones that I do watch, and I've been, I gotta get to The Wire, everybody talks about The Wire. And yeah, I, everybody I, says it's like the best show. Yeah, I know, and so I gotta get to that one, but it is, I don't have a ton of time to watch And, and Rick and Morty. And Rick and Morty, which you just <laughs> recommended, and I, I've been hearing a lot about that as well. So, so obviously your job, I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity to walk around with you for a, for a day and hopefully a couple more days and the work is pretty intense. And then I can just imagine that like, you've started how many years ago now? Seven. Seven eight, years. Between o seven Almost. Eight. I know that it, I mean, there's been some, some, you know, minute gaps, but it's mainly been day in, day out. Right. It's, it's, it's tiring, and even if you have the most amount of love for doing something, you got, there's got to be some days you wake up in the morning and say, I can't, I, I just can't get out of bed. Or Does that, does that go through your mind? And if, it, and if it does, what is the, the thing that actually makes you like, I, need, I have to do this? Yeah. It, well, I say that every day I wake up and say that today's the day I'm going to take a day off. And then uh, about, yeah, that's about every day around noon. And then about every day at four I'm photographing. I mean, the travel's exhausting. I mean, because... It's, the travel's a different intensity and a different pace. So what you're seeing is not is not my norm. Well, it let's is, look at New York as a yeah. It, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of my norm because I do. I've probably spent a year on the road these past four or five years. So you know, it's a big part of my life. Uh, the travel's extremely intense because it's just absolutely nonstop. Uh, New York, I I work every I try to work every day, um, but it's just two or three hours every single day. Um, you know, I go out, I get into, because, you know, it's really, it, it's not necessarily the physical walking around that's so tiring, it's just like the, the intense focus, 
Like, for example, this interview right here, we're talking for an hour and a half. It's, you know, it's mentally draining. You have to very much focus. I have to very much focus on my answers. You have to very much focus on my answers as well, you know, to kind of know what to ask and, and things like that. So it's just like, I think the, the mind expends a lot of, 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 of capital just remaining focused. It's like the feeling of taking a test, you know, for like an hour yeah. and a half. And so that's kind of the, the same energy expenditure that kind of goes into an interview. And so, you know, when you do that, you know, a couple times for like an hour each time and you really focus on somebody, it's mentally draining. Uh, so, you know, I try to do about uh, two hours a day of the photography and then I work on other projects. Right now I'm working on a documentary for a few years. I was working on the television series, which was an extreme amount of uh, energy expenditure. Um, I edited the thing myself, which took several hours every day. So the photography part is um, a couple hours a day, but normally that's only to free, my, free me up for other work uh, and other projects. That so I want so to what do. is it then that, that makes you persist with it? Because I, I mean, especially now, as how big it is now, you can kind of say, well, let me do this at a, you know, let me do it in a different pace. I don't think pace. so, though. I don't think so. I, I, I maybe you're right, um, but you know, so much of of keeping contact with your audience and the people who support your work is producing content. Um, you know, the the whole the whole way that the the distribution systems of of work and content uh, and art are designed these days um, isn't that people really go out and seek content; it, they have it served to them. You know, th that's been a big change uh, since the advent of social media. It's the way that we consume media. It's like we very rarely, you know, wake up this morning and say, I'm going to go visit this website. I'm going to go visit this website. We log onto our feeds and content gets served to us. Um, and so, you know, if it, the, the kind of connection that you have with your audience, you know, very much so is, is defined by, you know, the amount of, of work that you're producing. And even when I do take breaks and by breaks I mean focus on longer term projects I can I can feel um, you know I can feel the losing that that connection you know um, you know you'll run into people on the street and be like oh I, you know I haven't seen it in forever and, and stuff like that so you know there is especially and I think one of the reasons is I'm a single person that's producing content for 25 million people I mean if you look at other you know, you know, I, and I don't mean just pictures of selfies, you know, there's a lot of celebrities that have 25 million followers and just take pictures of themselves in nice dresses and their sneakers and whatever they do. Um, but as far as like producing original content um, and distributing it, you know, the other, the other entities that have uh, that big of a reach have hundreds of employees and sometimes yeah. thousands of employees. Uh, and to even be able to provide the slightest sliver of their output um, and their engagement with their audience uh, requires a massive amount of effort on my part. So, for instance, I mean, let's say you have probably more followers than, say, the, the New York Times, let's say, something that would have been inconceivable to consider like 10 years ago, that an individual working alone can have that. I mean, is that, do you look at this and say, you know, this is a brave new world, this is a tremendous opportunity, is it also peppered with, with uh, stuff that we need to be cautious about? I mean, you, as you mentioned, people use social media or use these platforms differently. Um, do you feel that it's, it's changed in a way? Do you feel that, uh, do you feel that there's a, you, you, wish, you wish things, there's, a, there's an opportunity there, do you wish things were, were different in terms of how things are moving? In, mm. in digital media, like, is there a trend towards? I mean, there is micro. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's a good word. Yeah, micro. I mean, I think there is. It's a what it is is it's a battle for attention. Uh, that's where the economy's going. Uh, these devices have us trained to be staring at screens at all times, and so more attention is being given to digital content than ever uh, because people are always looking at screens. Uh, therefore, you know, the, the game, uh, you know, for businesses and artists and creators uh, becomes to earn a piece of that attention. That's how you survive. That's how you make a living. Uh, if, that, if you're a company, that's how you produce for your shareholders is that you're fighting for a piece of that attention. 
uh, and therefore um, the the trend in content and the trend in what people are producing goes towards that most capable of commanding and retaining a attention. It's almost become a science, and you know I think the science has has started to produce content and zero in on content that is very gimmicky, is very eye-catching, is very easy to consume, um, sensationalist, uh, and therefore, you know, if you're writing a 20-page think piece, you have a much less chance of, of making a living, of surviving, of being a creator. And that concerns you? Uh, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Uh, you know, what, it's what's happening. You know, whether, you know, whether it, you know, whether it's concerning or a good thing or a bad thing, uh, you, you know. You think it's a zero sum, is a winner that comes out of this, you know, it's sometimes either going to go that way or that way, or there's always going to be a need for Well, I think there's going to be fluctuations, too. I mean, this is the point where we're at a time. You know, I imagine and I, I kind of hope that there's going to be a, I mean, and, and a lot of, of in humans in New York benefited from that a lot. I mean, yes, uh, there is a massive amount of work that goes into creating these stories, and I and I think I've tried to hit a sweet spot where you know I've tried to create work within that framework that also requires an immense amount of thought and effort to produce, and therefore I hope it carries a weight and a nuance that is absence in a lot of content, you know that um of that length so you know in a lot of ways humans of new york has benefited from the trend because it is easy to consume compared to a hundred page article or you know a thousand page book uh and you know and then there are there things coming up that uh you know take five seconds to consume or ten seconds to consume yeah. and are overly sentimental or over you know it's like it's, it's all a spectrum and you know i'm sure there are people who are very academic writers that, you know, speak about humans of New York in ways that, that we might speak about, you know, con uh, content that, that seems even, you know, easier to consume. Uh, so, you know, I think that that ultimately we don't want to race to the bottom and get to the point where we just have this, you know, unnourishing content that gives us a dopamine hit uh, and then, you know, keeps us hooked looking for the next one. Um, and so I hope that there's some sort of, you know, move in the other direction. And I think there is in a lot well, of ways. There's, there's so much like, you know, the internet or the social media rewards so much people sort of creating, curating this sort of perfect reel of their life, of their travels, of this and that. Do you think that that's like, you know, that's, that's nice because everybody sort of wants to, wants to feel good or do you think that's sort of feeding the problem? Uh, right. Well, and that's a different thing. Uh, there's the there's 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 I think the individual side of social media, and then there I mean that that atmosphere that you just described is, creates the consumer bed of social media, which are the people who are all are engaged on social media, and so much of that is ego driven. So much of that is sharing about our lives and, and the and the good feelings that come from being rewarded for that. And what that does is it creates a base of consumers that are on the platform and therefore that creates the market that the advertisers come into and also the businesses come into and the media producers come into. So it's two different sides. You know, we were talking about the professional content creation side. Um, this is the individual side of how individuals use social media. And now that I do think, you know, is getting to a, a very unhealthy place. Yeah. Um, and I think the world's realizing that, you know, this all happened so fast. I mean, this is, we're talking about five or six years ago that the, the saturation even started happening. So it's like, I, I don't think it would make sense that, that we would fully understand it yet. And I think it makes sense that, you know, consequences would, would come out of this, that, you know, the designers didn't intend and that the people using it don't fully realize. Um, you know, and I think I think it's starting to happen. You know, I think a, a lot of people are starting to understand. You know, the the unhealthy aspects of it. And I think it'll start to change. Yeah, I I, I hope it does. Yeah, hopefully, right? We um we met a few years ago. I think it was, it was 2015. We met uh, the speakers' dinner in Dubai, and uh, we were sitting right next to each other. And I think 
probably one of the first two things that I asked you was how is it possible that you can interview somebody for half an hour and, and just get these sort of really um, intimate, uh, have them, you know, in some ways pour their heart out and stuff like that. Do you remember what you, what your answer was? Oh, that's funny. No, and I'm curious if it, if it has changed since then. Um, you, you basically said to me, well, instead of, instead of explaining, why don't I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, okay. No, I, well, I remember interviewing you when you came to New York. Um, that's funny. Because I began answering the second question, um, and then you basically stopped me and said, well, listen, I want to interview, when are you coming to New York? Okay. And the funny thing is that I hardly ever go to New York, but I so happen to be going the, the, week, the following week. Uh, that's funny. And uh, I remember the New York part. I don't remember the Dubai. I remember, I remember meeting you in Dubai. I didn't realize that our interview had started there. But now that you say it, I can, I can picture it. Yeah. yeah, I think you asked me something about my ring, which I was wearing at the time. Um, I can't remember what the two questions were, but one of them was about that. And you said you don't remember that, that part, but I mean, and that's more not necessarily just trying to understand, like, how do you how do you sense like there's a story there? Because it was just literally we had just started speaking and you had already sort of come to a conclusion that this is an interview that I might want to do. But. I mean, your story is crazy and I don't even want to talk about it because we're going to start crying. But like, <laughs> I mean, for you, it's not that much of a. Uh, it's oh, man.